Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. So, born in Baku, Azerbaijan. So, my uncle was, I never met him, but he was the first one who created a, a gallery, who put, who put together a gallery in Baku during Soviet times. It closed down, but I think he was very much in touch with the you know, local scene. With my immediate family, my parents, my mother's a doctor, my father is in aviation. I guess I was exposed to art just with, within the family, but not to say, you know, I come from a family of significant collectors or, or always, you know, my parents have always been supportive, let's say, of the creatives in Azerbaijan, but it wasn't necessarily... I, I haven't really kind of grew up in it, let's say. So born in Baku and, and uh, we moved to Istanbul. When I was six, so my first grade at school, when we, me and my sister went uh, in, in Turkey to a British school. So I started, I picked up English in, in Turkey through our schooling. And then at home I'd speak in Russian. So we had, we had this kind of die you know, not like Ottoman, but dual language kind of upbringing. You stayed in Turkey until we were So we stayed till 99, so I was 12 or 13. We would spend our summers back in Baku. My father was already at a job there in, in Baku when we were still in, in Istanbul. So every holiday we would go to Istanbul, we'd see him. And on one of those holidays, there was a big earthquake in Turkey in 99. And my mother said, you know, took the golden opportunity and basically decided to, to come back to Baku for good. So we spent in Baku a few years. And then my sister got a position here in a, a, a university. She applied for university, moved here. And then a year later, I moved with her. And since then, I did my high school here. I did, um, I studied international relations at London School of Economics. So I was always, again, interested in art, but at some point I was, I was taking art classes myself. I did art for my A-levels. So for a few years while I was studying, I was um, trying to understand how, what it is I'm going to do, how I'm going to get into this kind of world, what would be useful, what I can, you know, where I can learn, where I can grow, etc. And so as soon as I graduated, I worked at Sotheby's, in, in the client development department. Then I worked at a commercial gallery doing the PR and then quickly I understood that it's, it's something that I definitely would want to not explore, but be more active in the business side of things. I thought there are too many artists out there, good artists. And I, I mean, it was, you know, I wasn't that serious about taking myself or developing in a way my, my artistic practice as, as, as an artist myself. I thought I would rather be, I'd be more helpful to, supporting artists who, who again, haven't been recognized yet, haven't been promoted yet, haven't been worked with yet. And because, I guess, of that thinking, I ended up being more involved and conversing more with artists who were younger, more mid-career, more, you know, again, un, not unrecognized, but, yeah, that, let's say, the market hasn't caught up with what they have been doing. Artists from where? Artists from all over. So when I started doing the exhibitions here, already under the, the gallery's name, so we first did these pop-up shows, and then these pop-up shows led to the opening of the space. Curatorially, it was all linked. Um, one show would lead to the next. In a sense, it was exploring the five elements, you know, so fire, earth, water. And when you started, you started with pop-up shows. That's right. right. Yeah, in the yeah. same place. No, 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 in, in, across London. So we had Belgravia, we had Shoreditch, we had a show in Paddington. So the idea, I guess, subconsciously for me, it was trying to figure out an area, a neighborhood where I thought the gallery would work, or at least what we're trying to do with this gallery, where, where, which neighborhood would work. You said that at the beginning you, you were somehow looking for artists who were not yet uh, first line. Exactly. Right? Not that they were second class, but that they were not well known, or they were not the important exhibition, mm -hmm. or the important uh, fairs. Mm -hmm. like exactly. So who were these artists? The idea was to bring Azeri artists 
in, in a good mix of artists from all over the world. So for me, it wasn't my aim in a way, it was not to have an Azeri program exclusively, an Azeri program here in London. It was more to bring in artists from that region into a, a kind of healthy dialogue with artists from all over. So I was very cautious at not becoming a regional gallery in a way, despite you know, the advice that was given when we just started saying, look, you know, you're, you're one of the few Aziris living here, you, you're, you should be promoting Azerbaijani artists, etc. But I thought it was too narrow, limiting, and the legitimacy of it wasn't. And I don't think it would have worked for a long time if you were to just focus on, on, on Azeri artists. So as a result, the, the curation, the, the, the programming became, yes, a, a mix. It was all about the kind of the the thinking behind the show. So these five shows that we started with in different spaces around London was based on the kind of emotional drive. Um, it was artists were sourced through recent graduates, through books, through research, just general research that I did. And, and again, I wasn't looking at where these artists are from. I was just looking at what they were producing. Medium didn't matter, sculptural, paintings, digital works. It was a very diverse group of well, a group of artists, for me, again, the most important thing was that there would be consistency and continuity. With these pop-up shows, I, I was very aware that, you know, you, you found, you, it's incredible to work in this way because you have the freedom of a different space each time, a different, you know, group of artists. But in my mind, it was always had to lead to a physical space, a permanent space where the gallery would become what it is. So when we opened the gallery... In 2012. Why is it called Gazeli? Gazeli, so it's from my, my mother. She's, uh, so she's, she's a doctor. In 99, she opened Gazeli Cosmetics, which then went into Gazeli Limited, which then became Gazeli House. It's basically, it's, it's the first cosmetics company in, in Azerbaijan that uses the ingredients of, you know, solely found in Azerbaijan. It's everything, skincare, hair care. And she's expanded that into a concept where one works on their inner and outer appearance. It's the importance of growing as an individual. And of course, art and culture fits right in there. So she, in Baku, she got this center called Gazeli House, um, where, you know, one can spend almost a whole day there from treatments to the galleries, part of that, the, the, that kind of house, that, that um, so you use it, that's why you use the name yeah, so we Because of that history, that because in, in Baku Gazeli Art House, it didn't have a separate space, but initiatives, they were, it was around. What is Gazeli Art House? Gazeli Art House is the art branch of Gazeli, in a way, the Gazeli as a, as a, as a company. So Gazeli Art House in Baku was found in 2003 not a physical space, but through that there were a few exhibitions. It was, it was found before London? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you did it, or your mother did it? No, I wasn't so involved. My mother was more involved in not running it necessarily as a, as a gallery because, again, it didn't have a physical space. She was always supportive of local artists. Um, so she would, within a space, for example, a cafe that's part of the like Azeri house, she would have a few artworks on the on the walls of Azeri artists that you know not many have heard of. And through that, she kind of, I guess, on the side, it was it was always present. But I wasn't. I was too young back then. I wasn't really fully involved. My input has really started from here in 2010, through, I guess, understanding my, how I can, what I can do towards developing, not necessarily the brand, but making use of the history of Gazeli Art House, bringing it over here, having that connection to Azerbaijan, all of these kind of things for me came together as I was here. I thought, you know, I'd be much more useful in London. Yeah, uh, you Bob. use all these artists. And did you find many clients? Absolutely. So the clients, initially, I thought I would be more exposed to Russian-speaking clients just because of the background and the language. But that quickly became, it didn't 
happen. I think younger clients, younger who had, um, and, and in terms of nationality, the kind of demographics, mainly European, some American who were passing through, friends of friends, it picked up fairly quickly for us to get a buzz out of when we opened the space here in, in Mayfair, but it wasn't enough as well. For me, the, the defining point was opening the space, the permanent space. I thought because of the address, because of the neighborhood, we were bound to, you know, every exhibition that we had, every artist that we'd show, it would, it would be a, a roaring success as, you know, sell out shows. But, but that wasn't the case at all. And the clients that we have made over the few years leading up to the opening of the space of course, they supported us, but again, it, it wasn't enough. So I think for the first few years, there was a bit of a disconnect between this incredible space with Richard Green's history, the gallery that was here before we came. They were here for about 15, 20 years. They've got a space now right next to Sotheby's British, modern, kind of, let's say, traditional dealers. When we came, I was unknown. My, the artists we work with, unknown in the sense of the, the you know, the, the heavyweights, let's say, in the area. Not the heavyweights, but, you know, the... the, the, the and the, also the artists. And the artists, absolutely. The artists haven't been shown in galleries. They've had some exposure, absolutely, in some group shows and museums or what have you, but, but they weren't... They didn't have a, a market, let's say, or an active market. So wasn't it a bit uh, pretentious or risky to be... Next to the uh, various throwback gallery or maybe Robbyland or other galleries on that level, just with unknown, you being unknown and, and artist unknown. For sure, pretentious, hopefully not, but for me, but that's the thing, it was more, I think, this youthful naivety, you know, that oh, they need to. Uh, but then what happened? We, Are you now accepted? In the neighborhood? Yeah. I mean, I think because the room back opened after we opened here, and this is Warner as well. So it was interesting because we, we had this, um, it was definitely an untraditional start, for sure. Now, next year, that's why with this book, for example, the five year, I mean, five year, it's really, when you think about it, it's nothing compared to the neighbors here. But uh, we had to make a statement that it's, it's we're not going anywhere, that it, there's a certain form of trust, because I, I understand from both collector side, even from the artist side, from the dealer side, there's always there will always be that skepticism of you know galleries popping up, uh, ambitious younger um, let's say dealers or galleries popping up their their, their spaces and then realizing it requires time and closing. Yeah, but you see nowadays the art market is mainly made either by auctions or by a few galleries who have a few artists that are very valuable. I mean, take an example of Adams, he has Kisha, he has Lazaritz, he has, you know, now I don't uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, important artists which are becoming or are very well known. Who is buying less known artists? So the, the idea, I mean, for, for us with, with the clients that we've, I guess, amassed, right, over the past few years, we've, we've slightly moved on from the demographic we had back in 2011 with these pop-up shows, in a sense. We moved onwards in terms of the, the client base. Back then, it was the more younger buyers who were buying at a certain level and, you know, happy to say, let's take, the, take, a, take a risk. They like the works, they, they want the works, and that was the end of it. Since opening the space here, we moved on in a sense. We still keep our contacts with, with this younger collector group. But being in this, in this neighborhood for us enabled to get into uh, or in contact with, you know, collectors who would who would be more after the artists that you just mentioned. So as a result, five years ago, we started creating these historical shows. We would pick a, a theme. So the first one was California Light and Space Movement. Light and Space. It's um, artists like Dwayne Valentine, uh, Mary Kors, Helen Vashigan, Artists who we wouldn't and haven't shown here before. But at the time I was exploring, let's say, the, the scene of LA, but I was going out there quite often. So for me, that historical angle was, was, was interesting. 
So we brought them in, we brought these works, these artists here, and slowly we realized that this is, again, it was a natural fit for the space here, for the neighbors, that that's the, that was the expectation, and that's the expectation of the walk-ins, let's say, expectations of people walking down Court Street, Bond Street, River Street. So I understood for the new kind of works to be appreciated, the new artists to be appreciated, we need to absolutely have at least one show of the program with the more recognized names. It would work well for us in terms of sales. It would work well for us in terms of meeting people that we otherwise wouldn't meet. As a result, the program became very diverse. It became maybe too diverse for some because there have been conversations I overheard where the gallery has been, you know, pe people weren't quite sure what we're standing for. Is it contemporary? Is it traditional? Are we doing primary? Are we doing secondary market? But to be honest, I didn't mind that. I still don't mind that because for us, it's the, the movement and the, that diversity is what's exciting, is what I think is supposed to be. You know, galleries, I think, shouldn't be necessarily pigeonholed either if they do something with very young artists in outskirts of central <laughs> Absolutely, I think, personally, for, for me at least, for us, for our... The what about the two Steenham Gallery in Baku? Right? Yeah, so the Baku was reopened in 2012. I thought, again, in my uh, kind of stupid naivety, I thought, ah, oh, it's okay, we, my parents are there, we've got a, a good network of people, it will work very well. We All we need to do is have a space and we can almost mirror the program that's happening in London. So for two years, we started bringing contemporary, quite conceptual young artists. Of course, complete disconnect with the local audience. They were fascinated. They were extremely interested and excited to, we would have the, um, you know, the turnout was incredible. Everyone knew about the gallery, but sales was, was complete flat. Even we knew. So uh, two years later, this is 2014-15, there was a choice. Do we continue or we just focus on London? And we decided to continue just because of the history of the gallery. It started in 2003, there was a lot more. It, it made sense to, to have a, a space there. So we expanded the space, turned it into more of a regional outreach in the sense of it would be... In 2012, I was always thinking kind of narrow-mindedly, it's just the Azeri market that the gallery there will appeal to. With this space that we refurbished and, and, and launched in 16, it's now, for me, in my mind, it's more of a regional thing. It's, it's a, a gallery that can, you know, serve for artists, collectors, just general tourists in that region. Because Baku, again, has become over the years quite a... It's more visited now than it was... 10 years ago, let's say. So it can definitely serve the space itself as a hub of, you know, pe people crossing or visiting Baku for a different purpose. Right. Um, and that has done well, that even thinking about it in that way, because as a result, the program in Baku, it wasn't as, you know, on, on steroids as it is here every six weeks. It was, there it's four, four shows a year, more expanded, more aware of the local artists, so we would show occasional, occasionally local artists, we would show... Oh, the artists in Baku. In Baku, a few which are great, most need support in terms of producing. A things. few very good. A few very good in the sense of being able to work on an, or already that work on an international scene. Some of them became famous. Some of them became famous Venice and Ali, for example, the past two or three iterations, they really launched the careers of some of them as every artist. There is Mike Ahmed, who, in terms of artists, or what? Venice and Ali, uh, artists. Artist Mike Ahmed, there was Rashad Ali Pera, there was literally a group of, uh, let's say, five or ten artists. How do you position yourself nowadays in London after? Ten years, as you are surrounded by major galleries. Over the years in, in London, we've, I guess, took a conscious decision of, of having this diverse, dynamic, let's say, exhibition program. Over the years, as a result, we now have a portion of the gallery, the way I see it, a portion of the gallery that, say, exhibits, supports, 
artists working in new media, right? Digital artists. So that's one section, which is the current show, the virtual reality. And that's that's the kind of next generation, let's say, of collectors that we're trying to reach out to and start having a conversation with. The biggest portion of the gallery is mid-career artists who have been working for a long time, and that's where I feel we can we can we can help and and, and continue working with and, and hopefully taking them to that next level of support and, and, and again exposure and interest. As a result of that, the collectors are those that are you not know, extremely on the younger side, but who are willing to, let's say, support an artist who isn't so widely talked about, let's say, or at least not yet. And definitely who is not in that kind of blue chip category that we were talking about earlier. Within that part of the gallery, within that program, there are artists who are from the region of, say, Central Asia, from Azerbaijan. We started hosting one show a year, which looks at Middle East and Central Asia artists. So we do group shows here because, again, it was important for us to obviously reach out and connect the, the spaces that we have in London and in Baku. So that's the big chunk of the gallery. These the artists, whether they're in the Jan, in the Central Asia and so on, are probably less well-known in, in Europe. So this is a way to, to make them known. And this has been interesting for young people, for... Not only young. Not only young. Not only young. No, no, no. This, these, these shows, we've only recently started doing them maybe three years ago, these group shows. Some of them are, have museum already exposure, let's say they've put on exhibitions of these artists here. But from the collector side, so, so a lot of curators would come. A lot curators. Of museum, museum curators would come for these shows. Collectors-wise, there are either experts from these countries that are based here and obviously are supporting the, the artists or, you know, collectors who've already had some kind of, for whatever reason, started supporting artists from that region already. But that region, it's mainly, you know, Iran, Turkey, well, Lebanon as well. And instead in Baku, right, this is what you're showing long, you don't show this in Baku. Exactly. So originally in 2016, when we reopened the bigger regional space, let's say, where right, in, exactly. in Baku, it's, it's 9,000 square feet. It's a very significant space. I thought it was the perfect time, place to start working with other galleries, with other artists that we would normally not work with here and show them in, in the space in Baku, because for most of these galleries and dealers and artists, they wouldn't necessarily think of Baku as a potential exactly. space. Indeed enough. I mean, what is Baku? Baku is a big city, very wealthy because of the oil. Oh, yeah. Yes, exactly. So Baku is probably... Now. Very close to Russia. What exists in Baku? Uh, the bourgeoisie or people who have a lot of money? Who, live there and come to the exhibition. Yeah, so Azerbaijan generally quiet. It's incredible how it's managed, but it's close to Russia, but not too close. It's in in terms of the, the geographic, I think geographically it's in such an incredible location because it has all these incredible powers around it. As a result, I think the mentality perhaps or the culture of the of the people there are very they're very open minded. So as a result, super curious. So what I found in the past, let's say since 2012, when we had the space there, people are very responsive. They would come to, to not anything you show, but they're very eager to, to learn and to understand. They've got the means, mainly, it is mainly through oil and gas, the, the kind of the background of the country, the, the wealth, let's say, they would uh, you know, be appreciative and, and, and enjoy it. But to actually start buying, they prefer to buy local Azeri artists. They for, for them I think it's more understandable. They more they more and so this is what you do. We started featuring more of local artists, Azeri artists. So initially the idea was we swap it around. We take Azeri artists here or at least show more regional artists here in London. So they may prefer to buy yes. in, in London. Absolutely. 
absolutely at auctions, at, you know, through other dealers who would have a primary relationship, let's say, with that artist or the estate. Having noticed that in Baku, uh, people prefer to buy local art, and then if they want to buy a pistolet or something, they'd rather buy it uh, on auction or at the original galleries. It seems to me that it's a wonderful story because we have an Istanbul story where East meets West, and it's the cultural exchange uh, that Mila is doing between these two regions, which is not easy to do and, and which has its own challenges, but which is part of the new globalized world where the different cultures, which are very firmly rooted in their own geography sometimes, are still able to meet at an international level in a city like London on a street like Dover Street. Yes, exactly. And that, that's the exciting part for me. It's, it's what we can do in a sense of our aim, you know, where I see this going. If I can help with promoting, making superstars out of some of the artists coming from Azerbaijan, I will do everything I can. I was shying away from it at the beginning here because it's a very short-lived life for a gallery to be specialized in one or another region. And even here, I think there were a couple of galleries that opened up while we were already open. And very soon they were specialized in Iranian art. It's a very interesting region. I'm sure that there are quite a few collectors and supporters who would make these exhibitions for us financially make sense. But still, to base your whole program as a gallery on artists from that region, it might be quite risky for me, even more risky than having this dynamic exhibition program in the middle. Who are the well-known Western artists that you work with? So generally we had these, the, the historical shows we've been putting on. We've shown works by Bridget Riley, Sam Francis. In London, at least, there's been a big focus on the 60s and 70s British modern kind of abstract expressionist period. Just now over the summer, during lockdown, our first show. So we've opened actually an exhibition here in London with two Azerbaijani masters, one who's no longer alive, who's never been shown in London before, called Ashraf Murad. Mm -hmm. The other artist who's, he's in his 70s, he's again a very notable artist in, in Azerbaijan. He's been exhibited in London a couple of times, but never at the gallery. So we've opened this show in February, then lockdown happened. So again, as a result, there were a few promised visits by the curators from Tate, from British Museum, that were very excited to see the, the, the exhibition, but of course it, it never happened. So when we reopened the space in June, the exhibition still continued for about a month or something. And then in July, we've opened the show that brought together Robert Motherwell, Sam Francis, there were about 10 or 15 artists we were looking at basically the development of abstract expressionists in the US and in the UK. There were a few kind of names associated with that with that time frame that we didn't we haven't shown in the past. But the other names include uh, Du Buffet we've shown, we've shown Basquiat we've shown, but this was part of the Robert Fraser's exhibition that we've done last year. Paolozzi we've had at some point. Every historical show that we've put together, it kind of made sense to feature these, say, blue chip names. It wasn't the other way around, in a way. You have an anniversary coming up, is that right? Yes, next year, but anniversary of the gallery in, in London. Ten years. Ten years. With these artists, the Azeri artists, what range of price you sell for? So the two that we've had in the show that I've mentioned earlier ranges from, say, 20, 20 to 80, 100,000. The rest of the Azeri artists that we've shown and that we've worked with, it ranges even on the lower end from, say, 5 to 30, so very, to 30,000, so very much kind of, let's say, affordable. Most of the artists that we represent falls within that kind of range comfortably from, say, 10,000 to 50,000. 
there's always been on our minds this awareness of pricing these works correctly, not underpricing, not overpricing, because a lot of the times we do help build markets for the artists. Um, you know, either there is already an existing market, but outside here or outside Europe, over the years, we've always had these kind of internal discussions to make sure that we're true to the quality of the works and, and also... And you heard about you had the same time during this pandemia, during this month, you so. We've had... It, what helped us is the secondary market, the historical works, because... So it was very interesting. While we had the two Azerbaijani masters that no one has heard of, physically in the gallery that no one has seen, the show no one has seen, we were selling works of recognized, let's say, names online to collectors who we dealt with before, who knew what they were looking for, who knew the artists that they were buying. So this, for me, it came all in, in, in my mind. It all kind of became clear that this is, I guess, where what the next 10 years, five years, 10 years looks like. It's in the physical space. You know, we still continue showing works. We still continue supporting artists that maybe aren't your household names, whether they're from Azerbaijan or they're from US or wherever they're from. And then in the meantime, we continue working with more of say, established names who... Which names? The same ones we were looking at, we, we were mentioning. Mercedes Matter, an American artist who hasn't really been recognized as such. Pearl Fine, another lady artist. She's got following in a sense of, she's not your kind of pastia or, or you know, but, but she still has a certain kind of following, which are represented by Pistoletto. Pistoletto for sure, Pistoletto, um, Dubuffet, Bridget Riley, Plum, John Plum, another British artist, Richard Smith. You understood, mm -hmm. if I'm not wrong, that galleries are used to do shows, to show that the gallery is working and the cultural move, but uh, because of happened, sales are mainly on the internet. You sell better known artists on a second market on the internet, but you keep the gallery open with uh, artists uh, that maybe sell less, but they give the, the name to the gallery. They keep up your name. Right? Yeah. And you think that this will be more and more what will happen in the future? I think so. Because I think that if, if you think about it, when you when you go around, say, Mayfair or wherever, and you go into a gallery, you haven't, regardless of what the gallery is or how long it's been there for, you walk in and you haven't seen an artist, but you, you, don't, you haven't heard of the artist before. It would be easier to understand what the artist has been up to, what he is, who he is, when you have a normal conversation with the, whoever is at the gallery rather than doing an online search. I think the online world, it helps you research secondary market auction prices, how much the work was sold for, when all of this information that blue chip artists have. For that, it's, it's priceless. But to find out new artists, it's much easier to do it in real life. Walk into the gallery, talk to the gallerist or whoever is at the gallery. It's much easier. And then you go well, How do you find your artists? It's been research online, recommendations partly, but most of the recommendations we've never, for some reason, it has never worked. So it's mainly either through books, through music. See that shows drown you very well known gallery. I mean, it's the only gallery that we have there which has a London outpost. You are the only gallery. The only gallery. We, we, the only gallery with a London outpost. There are two or three other commercial galleries which do local, which mainly work with local artists. We are the only gallery international. Yes, for sure. Yes. And how many people are in Baku, go to Baku? Population, it's about, so in the whole of Azerbaijan, I think just recently they hit 10 million mark. Um, in Baku itself, it's four, four and a half million, probably like this. And there is going and coming people? Yeah, there is. Hopefully it will get back to normal, but 
there is a lot of, in the past five years, let's say six, seven years like this, there's been a lot of, you know, Eurovision contests, Formula One, uh, the European Games. How much time you spend in Baku to look at the Uganda? So um, in, in Baku, I go there every two, three months, uh, maybe for a week for a week or 10 days. Here, my life is here. We have you know, two children, the family, my family, my, my own family is here. But the way the gallery works there is the program is, let's say, developed, put together here in London. And then I would go out to Baku, have them. You, you go to fairs and things like this. Yes, so we've done over the past, let's say, even, I think our first year was uh, fair was in 2012, if I'm not mistaken. So for the past eight years, the first three, four years when we just opened in London, I've done Silicon Valley Art Fair, Mexico, Zona Marco, Miami, I did Art Miami. Uh, in Europe, we did Basel, but we did a, a satellite fair, not obviously the main, but not the Art Basel. But here we haven't, uh, we've done touring, we've done Artissima. In London, we've done Photo London, we've never done Freeze. This year, we, this year is the first year we're doing Freeze Sculpture Park. Uh, we have There's no Freeze this year. No, but they're still doing the Sculpture Park, Freeze Sculpture Park and Regents Park. They're still going to have that, so we're doing that. There are less fairs. Has been a liability for your business or not? Not quite, no, because for us the past two, three years we really cut back on fairs. Now we were aiming to get into the main, let's say, fairs, the Art Basels and Freeze. For me, all these other fairs are great. But they, we, so you will really go to Art Basel and Freeze? Yes, if we get accepted, when we get accepted. But we've done Hong Kong Art Basel a few years ago in 15 or 16, so we did try Hong Kong as well. Actually, we, we got accepted to West Bond in Shanghai uh, this November. The fair is still going ahead. And for a very long time, we were discussing whether we should be going there. None of the international galleries are going. It's still a two-week quarantine in place, but it's actually, you can have to leave the hotel. Room. You have a lot of Asian clients? Not yet. And Not that's why... With West Bond, um, with with the Shanghai Fair, we were hoping that we would really dive into into your, your clients are mostly young people. Mostly young, mid, I mean, say from early thirties to fifty, let's say. Um, and the many Russians, or not so many. Not many, not yet. What is your majority of clients? European and American, Amer American even more. You think London will remain a good base? For art, or with the Brexit and all that, it can become less important. It can't. It can't become less important. Mm -hmm. it, can, it cannot. No, it can't become less important. It might change in terms of the exhibitions. And you think that the internet things are going to become something really important? In other words, people who want to buy without seeing. I think it will become important, but it won't replace the physical space. What a physical space serves to showing an artwork, an artist, an exhibition, not of the digital platforms, virtual reality kind of spaces, etc. None of that will ever replace anything. The need for a physical space. So galleries will still be necessary. I think so. Maybe what's happening now, maybe there will be a kind of a filter, right? Maybe, maybe. Do you think that like in the fashion world, they sell more and more by internet and they think that shops, their shops, are not necessarily the place where people buy, but they are like museums, or like, like events. Yeah. So do you think that galleries will be more and more like that? Possible. Like type of museum kind? Yes. Yes, very possible. Very possible that... Therefore, you will have to make a special effort to create in the gallery layout, momentum... Yeah, in terms of making it more of a spectacle. The vitrines and all that will be important. Yes, 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 for sure. I think so, because I think even, even when, when people come in to see 
the exhibitions, they wouldn't necessarily buy there and then. They would go back and their exhibit dialogue, at least that's been our experience since opening here. We've made a lot of great friends, collectors, who we got to know, who we, who we met basically from them just walking in from the streets. But it never already pre-COVID, pre-lockdown, it never, it, it never really happened. They there and then decided to buy a work and here you go, these are my payment kind of details. It was always afterwards. So I think that will probably continue. Being um, from Azerbaijan, being a woman, was it more difficult to be accepted in the world of the art dealers in London all over the world? I don't know. For me, it wasn't the, the, the sex that was an issue, it was an age, for sure. Okay, thank you. Alan L. Can interviews.